Hello, friends. You are getting two episodes of Comic Book Couples Counseling this week. Today, you're about to listen to a Patreon preview, a version of a conversation that we had with Matt Bores and Ben Clarkson about the really excellent Justice Warriors comic. We wanted to put this into the main feed because we want you to be aware of what we're doing on our Patreon feed. We're really proud of the episodes that we're putting out there and excited for more people to join. This is the type of episode that you can hear at the dollar level. Yes, for $1, you are going to get so many more conversations with really rad creators. So please give that some consideration as you listen to this preview. Bum bum bottom 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 bum bum bottom
And I think we bought like 70 books. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we went, went a little uh, hog wild. What do you call those uh, little, gro- like those reusable grocery bags? Tote? That, like a tote bag, right? We filled a tote bag with single issues. Yeah. It was... It was nuts. It was yeah. nuts. Uh, yeah. Crying Freeman and some other Katsuhiro Otomo comics. Like, it, yeah. I, I, yeah. It was it was really wild. And then also, uh, we finally got to meet Mark Wade in person. How fun is that? He was there. Uh, and of course, we brought our little Absolute Kingdom Come issue that we had previously gotten signed by Alex Ross. And then we, you know, get to chat with Mark Wade. You know, every time you meet somebody in the flesh that you have previously had a really nice experience via Zoom. Mm-hmm. You know, Mark's been on the show a couple times. You never really know what the rapport is. What the rapport is going to be. If they like. even remember you. Yeah. And so you're like, oh, hey, Mark, uh, you, you might not remember us. We're Brad, Lisa, we're coming for couples counseling. And, you know, Mark said, oh, you guys, you asked the great questions. Yeah. And- we, he didn't even, the bar was so much lower than that. He's like, you actually had prepared questions. <laughs> <laughs> so it was that statement that we actually had prepared questions that made me go like, maybe he actually does remember us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we do prepare questions. Yeah. That is true. That is us. <laughs> That's very Lisa anyway, as you'll hear in this conversation with Matt and Ben coming up. But it was really nice to chat with him. We, You know, we, we got a little more famous. FaceTime with him than you would at, say, another con. Like, even if you saw him at Baltimore Comic Con, you probably wouldn't get as much time as we got at Big Lick Comic Con. And sitting next to him was Jim Shooter and Tim Seeley was there. Like, I would be on the lookout for the small cons in your neighborhood because those are the cons where you get more time with creators, but also... That's where you find the dealers who may not be selling at eBay prices. Right. right? Uh, there are a lot of gold in them hills. Yeah. And then that night, <laughs> we took our nephew to see a movie. Oh, yeah. And we, uh, you know, he's 17. Yeah. Okay. That's practically an adult. He could have bought the ticket himself. Yeah. He could have gone. Uh, but we took him to, to see. see uh, a Nicolas Cage movie. He's a uh-huh. big fan of Nicolas Cage. He, he, yeah, he, he loves genre film. He'd already seen this movie. Yeah, many times many he times. said. Yeah, and and he wanted to see it on the big screen, and yeah. he'd never gone to the Alamo Draft House in Ashburn. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we were like, okay, we'll go. We'll go watch Mandy with you. <laughs> uh-huh. I asked his mother, and his mother was like, oh, yeah, he saw, he's seen it a whole bunch of times. That's totally fine. And I had I have been in the theater twice with Mandy playing. I fell asleep both times. Yeah. That the beginning of that movie very ethereal, yeah. very stylized. I found it a little soporific the first time through. But for this watch, oh man, I was <laughs> wide awake. <laughs> wide awake, constantly watching how me- uh, I'm not going to name the person, uh, mm-hmm. how our nephew was watching the watching it. And it like I love that movie. I mm-hmm. love that like I was it's, on board. It's Brad's jam. Yeah, it might be my favorite Nicolas Cage movie. Opens with a fridge, closes with a, a murder spree. <laughs> opens, Brad's- with, opens with a fridge. How dare you be so brutally accurate? <laughs> um, but like, we don't want to like spoil too much about that film. But if you have not seen Mandy, it's a pretty gnarly movie. It's and- it's uh, violent and also pretty sexually explicit, yeah. which is really fun. Next to the like, I remember the day you were born. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and so it was a little stressful watching it with with our nephew, and I enjoyed the movie, but I felt, you know, we're child-free. You know, yeah. we don't have this experience too often. So this was a very new experience for Brad and Lisa. This this actually felt like the most adult thing I've ever done in my life. Oh, yeah. And, like, it put me back to the days when I was a child with my dad going to watch From Dust Till Dawn, uh-huh. right? And I... I I immediately called my dad the next day and I was like, was it stressful watching these sexually explicit, extremely violent things with your child? And why did you do that? (laughs) You know, why, why are we doing that? And, and again, like, you know, our nephew is 17. He's not a kid. You know, my dad was bringing children to these kind of heinous movies Uh, and I loved them and, and our nephew loves them. And so I shouldn't feel weird about it. Right. Or should I feel weird about it? I don't know. Uh, Like, so uh, I don't think he'd mind us saying this, but um, our friend and also patron Chris Chaka, we saw him on Sunday and he has kids around the same age as this nephew. And we were like, would you take your kids to see Mandy? And he was like, hell no. (laughs) (laughs) And we had just seen 
lone wolf and cub sort of vengeance with Chris Chaka and his children. Yeah, so you, Mandy's got to be pretty bad. <laughs> I, I think, like, to me, I go, like, <laughs> and this is why we're not parents. Like, you know, if his mother said it was okay, that's not on us, uh, right, if we damaged him. I, I, it was, so here's the thing. We came out of that screaming, and we had an hour car ride home back to his place. Mm -hmm. And we got to talk Mandy. And pretty, we got to, to it, talk themes of Mandy, yeah, which and, I really appreciated. And so I came away with that feeling really good that, you know, um, this is, like, I, how do I want to phrase this? Uh, there were certain moments in that film that I think he was struggling to understand the they purpose were, of. They were over his head yeah, a little and, bit. I feel like we helped him figure out those scenes. Yeah. You know, one of the scenes being the Nicolas Cage freak out in the bathroom scene, mm -hmm. which some people in the audience laughed at. And to because me... Because it's over the... T like, it's over the top. Out of context, it is an over-the-top scene. And I think you, when you laugh at that, you are laughing at it out of the context of yeah, the scene. Yeah, you're laughing like, look at Nicolas Cage, he's doing something silly. You're suddenly interacting with Nicolas Cage, the meme version of Nicolas Cage. And so... I, I just feel like you're acting, you're, you're, wa you're observing out of the film. But if you observe that scene within the film, it's a really sad, scary, Devastating. complicated scene because, you know, he's drinking this vodka. It's burning the cuts on his lips. He's in physical pain. He's in physical pain. He's in emotional torment. Because his, his wife just got fridged. And he's also psyching himself out. Uh, psyching himself up to go to battle with these demon biker Manson types, mm -hmm. right? And I love that scene. And so it was kind of fun to talk to me about that scene. You said his name. Will you bleep it out? Yeah, I'll bleep it out. I'll bleep it out. Yes to all that you just said. Being 17 is like such a weird age. Yeah. Because you're like, you're supposed to be a, like a legal adult, like in a year, but you also are still, you're still like a, Dumb kid in the brain. And plus, like, you know, the pandemic happened. This person, this nephew became like a, an extreme, like, indoor kid. He doesn't get out much. For me, I feel felt like it was an opportunity for him to try on the adult pants. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going out with members of my family. We're going to see this movie. We're going to have a really thoughtful conversation about it. And, and his mother texted us and thanked us for taking him out and saying he was, like, really in great spirits um, the following day because he had had this nice night out. Like, so... And we had gone to Barnes & Noble and we bought him some manga. It turns out that uh, that this nephew and Brad are reading the same stuff, which is, like, so <laughs> wild. Like, we haven't gotten... Like, he was with zero, like, because he's very 17, zero knowledge base going, like, this is why manga is so much better than... Western comics. I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> and I'm just like, you you know, like, hey, you're an adult. You're entitled to your opinion. You're also entitled to be schooled by your aunt and uncle. <laughs> but and boy, is there nothing that Brad likes more than schooling somebody? I know. I should see a therapist. But about I it. like, I think for our comfort reasons, like, I don't want to take bleep. I'll bleep that out. <laughs> I don't want to take this nephew out necessarily to see whatever the next Mandy is. But maybe that at the end of the month, that 2001 Space Odyssey screening that would be really great one of my all-time favorite films i will always go see 2001 a space odyssey on the big screen yeah but now it's like we have to keep in mind we have other nieces and nephews yeah. that we are not taking out and nibblings and nibblings yep. uh, not taking out as like to have this like night <laughs> like n this is the night you are our king <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> like we don't do that a lot so now we have to think like well what would we have to incorporate some other nibblings into yeah some yeah fun events. i don't know i like i've really been enjoying being a hands-off aunt yeah yeah, and you know, the next day we did our screening at the Alamo Draft House in Winchester, Virginia. Which uh, this nephew declined to come see right. with us. Not a superhero person. We yeah. saw Superman 1 and Superman 2, the Richard Donner cut, and we had some patrons show up. So I just yes. wanted to do like a shout out to some patrons. Chris Chaka, you've already mentioned. Yes. Sean Eastridge flew from Atlanta for this screening in Northern Virginia. Or not Northern Virginia. Winchester's just in Virginia. As it's Winch the middle of Virginia. Winchester keeps telling They do me. not like being 
being called Northern don't, Virginia. Yeah, don't call them Nova. Uh, and so Sean flew out for it and helped host because Sean of the Missing Frames podcast, he actually interviewed Richard Donner right before he passed away. One Link of the last show interviews. Notes? Link in the show notes to the Missing Frames Richard Donner episode. And then James flew from Colorado yes. to come to the screening that and hung out so with James. Fun. And actually... I, I want to do another shout out to another patron, Scott, who didn't come to the Superman screening, but I randomly ran into Scott at the Bruce Campbell last fan standing event, the Bruce O'Rama thing in Rockville, Maryland, and I finally got to meet Scott in person. How fun is that? I didn't get to meet Scott, and so now I'm jealous. It was great, and you missed a really interesting event, Lisa, at that last fan standing thing. Uh, follow the B&B show, link in the show notes, to see our coverage of Evil Dead Rise, as well as that event. Brad and Brian had a lot of fun shooting last fan standing for PGC TV. So, yeah. Okay. I We've, we've really set up this interview. <laughs> we have overstuffed our week, and now we overstuffed our banter. And for that, I do not apologize. Yeah. Yeah. Not we, at all. And we... Ate mostly just Senior Ramon's overstuffed tacos. <laughs> we went to Senior Ramon's three times, three days in a row. And you know, like it's got to be good if Lisa is risking becoming a regular. I hate being a regular. And today, the 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 uh, wait staff was like, "Hello again," and I was like, "Burn this place to the yeah. ground." Well, we I'm had never to coming take back. James and Sean, yeah. uh, out to Senior Ramon to uh, uh, send them off before they got on their flights today. So. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it's been a great time. And yeah. Oh, we also somewhere within that time, we had a great conversation with Matt Bores and Ben Clarkson about Justice Warriors, which is now available as a trade paperback from Ahoy Comics. And I got to say, not enough people are talking about Justice Warriors. I agree. Justice Warriors is incredibly inventive, really thought provoking. The art is astounding. I think it's some of the best art I've seen all year. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, and we get into all of that with Ben Clarkson. Lisa, can you just read the back of the comic oh, right there? Yeah, sure. <laughs> this is how they're selling it. It's a really simple like statement on the back of the trade paperback. I don't see the statement. No, just about. read the words. Read the words that you're seeing there. Bubble City, the money stays in, and the Justice Warriors keep us in our places. And that's all the advertisement on the back of the book. I kind of love that. Oh, yeah, that's hardly a blurb. That's like a blurb. Yeah, it's, it's barely a sentence, right? Yeah. But what you see on the back of that trade paperback is an incredibly detailed dystopian future. And you don't see pages like that. Like Ben Clarkson tortures himself with these panels. These are not this like Justice Warriors is not a comic where it's all um characters in the foreground and blank backgrounds. There it's, is some of that. There's some of it, but some barely. It's this really... is a hyper detailed comic and when you see a comic like this on the stands, you got to go, "Whoa, what is going on here?" It does feel like something incredibly special. Yes. But if you are not sold on that very brief blurb on the back of the trade paperback, let me just go ahead and read you how they are describing Justice Warriors on the Ahoy Comics website. And it is this. Now in one volume, the acclaimed dystopian satire co-created by cartoonist, publisher, and Pulitzer Prize finalist Matt Bors and adult swim filmmaker Ben Clarkson. Outside the walls of prosperous Bubble City, Two tense cops patrol the uninhabited zone, a vast slum where most of the population lives, many of them mutants. After his partner is killed by a self-driving bus, traumatized veteran swamp cop must teach naive rookie shit that the UZ can only be policed by breaking every rule. Yes, his name is Shit, S-C-H-I-T-T. -T. Like Shit's Creek. Like Shit's Creek. But his head is a dookie, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a poo emoji. He's a walking poo emoji. Mm -hmm. And that's the joy of Justice Warriors is the surrealism, the absurdity. Like anything can exist in this world. Yes, anything can exist, but also it's barely not here. It's yes. barely not current America. Bubble City operates as like the 1% who just pretends like the rest of us do not exist. There is um, one of the early riot scenes is because 
people are trying to steal Nutrilac, yeah. which is baby formula, <laughs> yeah. right? That doesn't sound familiar at all. Yeah. <laughs> like the comic is, you know, like like we said at the beginning of this episode, it's very funny, but it's also maybe like too real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it does take you to places that get you fired up. And we talked to Ben and Matt Immediately after Lisa finished reading Justice Warriors, and you were riled. Yeah, yeah. I was definitely still processing. Like, I'm one of those people, like, I really have to regulate my news intake, my, like, current cultural conversation intake. Because and your social media feeds, you curate the heck out of those. Because you can block all over the because place. Because I can become paralyzed with rage yeah, you know yeah. i could become like it like ugh, i it, like i just can't take it sometimes yeah it takes you to a dark place and i think that justice warriors for as beautiful as it is for as funny as it is it took you to it, some dark places it pokes you in all of the places that hurt i i hope you're okay if i mentioned this story and you okay. can tell me to edit it out if need be <laughs> yeah. but we once went to see at the alamo draft house in one loudon mm-hmm. uh dr strange love and yes. you had never seen dr strange love before and that is a film that is very funny but also incredibly bleak and you felt very uncomfortable and i'm speaking for you correct me if i'm wrong but it seemed to me that you felt very uncomfortable listening to people laugh while watching the end of the world via dr strange yeah i just can't separate those things and you cried pretty heavily at the end of dr strange yeah 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 and i think that justice warriors hits you the same way that that movie did sort of thing when i'm reading a story i understand intellectually that it's like hypothetical but i also like take it as like well this is the story and if this is the story swamp cop losing his first partner because of a bus accident is sad. Yeah. And also people rioting because they can't feed their families is sad. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like it's all depressing to me. And it just, it's intended. Like we talk a little bit about like, what is the intention be t- behind political cartoons and things like that. For me, like part of the, part of the reason stories exist is to like activate you. You know, and to, you know, as you pro- process it hypothetically, you can, I can now have a plan of how I'm supposed to encounter this in the real world. I forgot where that sentence started, but like I felt activated. Yeah. But at the same time, a lot of the point of Justice Warriors is how powerless we are as individuals. If the institution itself, if the entire culture is run on, Um, the backs of disenfranchised people, it's really hard. There's really nothing anyone can do, right? What's interesting about the comic is that it's coming from two perspectives. One creator is hopeful and one creator is not hopeful. Right. And we get into that a little bit too. I think that's like a great setup for this conversation. And I'm really excited for you to listen to it. I really hope that if you have not checked out Justice Warriors yet, that you do so. Click on the link. Go look at some of these pages. The art alone should entice you. And then the rest of it is gravy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it might also infuriate you the way it infuriated Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> in a good way. In a I great think way. ultimately in a, great a positive way. way but yeah. it just made for a weird conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, sit back and quote unquote relax to this chat with Matt Bores and Ben Clarkson talking about Justice Warriors. Ben and Matt, welcome to Comic Book Couples Counseling. Hello. Hey, thanks for having us. We are thrilled to have you on the podcast, Talking Justice Warriors. Uh, I got to say, we, we were reading the comic earlier today, and it is crazy funny. It's extremely funny. Also, very brutal and kind of leaves you feeling like, ugh, the planet. <laughs> <laughs> that is a hell of a headspace to operate in, which I know you both are familiar with operating in that headspace. Yeah. You know, I come from political cartooning and, uh, you know, this, it's a very political book and, uh, but we wanted to merge sort of high and low culture. You know, there's, we're going after a lot of targets from boom and bust economy to uh, social media and, and police, obviously. 
but also there's you know a poop guy who's the one of the main characters there's a ton of over the top violence there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, low low culture jokes in it and also uh you know political stuff yeah we wanted to really um uh bring back that spirit of or for me Matt's not a Simpsons guy, really, but me, early Simpsons, early couple season Simpsons where you can mix really juvenile, stupid sight gags with uh, some smarter commentary in there, but then mix it in with Judge Dredd. Yeah. Yeah. Dredd is very um, familiar. Like, like you can feel a Dredd influence here. Hearing the Simpsons, that also makes a lot of sense. Uh, the illustrations, like you were saying, you know, it's a beautiful looking comic with a lot of absurd things, but also like the perspective on the panels, I do feel like there's a lot of influence from like 90s era comic book. Well, I want to say that this is Ben's first comic book. Right. Which I feel is uh, impressive. He's uh, crazy. I've been I've been drawing him for 20 years and I, and I think he's better than me. Um, so that's all Ben. Yeah, a lot of that's just uh, my comic book influences. I have a big blind spot, honestly, on American and North American comics. Mostly for me, it's manga and French comics. Because mm. that's what, because I started reading French comics to teach myself French so I could actually have a conversation with uh, my extended family because I married uh, a French woman. And so comics were easy to read for me. So, uh, yeah, like Mobius, uh, yeah. Asterix and Obelix. There's a lot of Asterix and Obelix in Justice Warriors too. Um, yeah, but a, a lot of that stuff is, is more uh, like 60s French comics and 90s Japanese comics. The Prince character in particular felt very much like something you would see in a Yodorovsky Mobius kind of book. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I had the inkle open on my desk basically at all times. Uh, I'm curious about what you feel is the function of uh, political comedy, political comics. They're not necessarily to change hearts and minds. Like, what, what are they for? Good question. Um, you know, I've been kind of asked stuff like that for my whole career because I was doing political cartoons, and it's like, well. What do these do? You know, do these change anything? Do they comfort the afflicted or speak truth to power or change minds? It's, you know, I don't know. I mean, one one piece of fiction or pop culture, you know, doesn't by itself change anything. But you know, most people's uh, individual actions, even political actions, you know, don't change anything in and of themselves. So, you know, uh, in the real world, you know, you can you can do things. You can go register people to vote. You can go uh, organize a union at your workplace. So you could become a environmental terrorist if you want to get radical. You know, there's a few things uh, that you can do. And then in your professional life or your free time, I guess you can create art or fiction if you want to about the world. I don't know what it does, but I know that I'm I'm drawn to doing things about about the world and what's going on in it. And I guess the the highest goal maybe that you could achieve with a piece of fiction is giving people a new way to relate to a topic. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, like sometimes that's happened with like, big, you know, big, the biggest science fiction films or, or novels of the time, you know, Handmaiden's Tale or The Matrix. And so if Justice Warriors was was popular enough, you know, we 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 would want people to to relate to it and just be like, oh, this is like Bubble City. You know, we're trying to describe what's going on now in a more uh, crazy, dialed up way. And in a way that's not so dour that you can like process your feelings a bit, a bit from a distance, because mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> when you think about the world, it can get really overwhelming. Yeah. And so uh, something with a bit of distance, that's also not preaching to you where you can draw your own conclusions, mm -hmm. because often you're not really encouraged to make your own conclusions with deciding what's happening with the world, that you're given sort of preset answers. And that's something we satirize in the book as well, is how dangerous it is, dangerous it is to be given uh, a sort of ready-made answer for what's going on and how difficult it can be to sort of wrap your head around what is happening. Uh, for me, like, um, reading Justice Warriors, like, with 
a stimulant with a cup of coffee in my hand. It's just like <laughs> it, it it wakes me up so entirely because not like because you get that like kind of righteousness rush. Yeah. Like when you go like, yeah, that's this is correct. You know what I mean? <laughs> like <laughs> I'm ready to do some action right now. Like I like I'm so entirely like fired up. And right now on the main feed channel, um, we're reading Invincible and we've paired it with a book called uh, Permission to Feel. And uh, part of Permission to Feel is like, um, in order to deal with your emotions, you have to be able to label them with granularity. What exactly am I feeling? Mm. And I feel like that's what Justice Warriors is doing for me politically (laughs) because I feel like, okay, this is giving me some new vocabulary in order to articulate what exactly is making me angry. Like having, having the term bubble city, like at my fingertips or have having um, this character of, uh, of the prince and, and his uh, little sycophantic yes people like at my fingertips it goes, uh, okay. Yeah. That, that articulates like what exactly is making me angry right now. Oh, great. That's the, then it's accomplishing what, what we compliment. want. Yeah. That you're, you just saying what I tried to say, but a lot better. That's, that's uh, hearing it from a reader is uh, that's good. That's what we're, that's what we're going for. And re and reading it on stimulants is recommended. It is a very yeah. it, uh, uppers are recommended. Yeah. Like I said, it's sort of, we try to dial everything up because we're coming into doing this stuff, you know, you mentioned Judge Dredd. Judge Dredd already exists. Other comics with mega cities exist like Top Ten and Transmetropolitan. And, you know, sometimes can feel like everything's been done. So we just we wanted it to be even crazier than anything that's been done before. You know, there's like it's not just mutants. It's like there's cartoon characters. There's people with anything you know a tongue for a head it's uh which all comes from ben's imagination that most of that stuff isn't written into the script he just goes goes wild so lisa and i have been talking a lot about this subject of like the purpose of political art we went to a screening of sorry to bother you several years ago with boots riley in attendance and he said something about that film being a rallying cry for people to uh you know to gather around and you know this question of like can art change minds is almost less interesting to me as th- than you know w- the point of art being like let's gather our friends together let's sharpen our focus on what we actually feel as a society and then move towards that well like i feel like the the current like political culture just and culture culture is crazy making. And Mm -hmm. I think um, the the way you guys have kind of stratified, like, okay, we have the 1% thing happening over here. We have um, social media culture happening over here. We have capitalism happening over here. And they're all making us feel powerless. And kooky. And kooky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And absurdism works so well with all that stuff. One thing that you've, you've done that's really interesting is like, um, you every, every there's no really nobody is really 100% correct everybody is operating on some level of like untruth including like the the libra yeah yeah gang can you talk a little bit about like trying to keep this environment free of uh perfectly good guys well it helps that we uh so part of the perspective that Matt and I share and which has been developed from the conversations we had with writing the book is that um, we don't know what's what's correct, mm-hmm. right? Like we have our we have ideas, but often our ideas hit when they hit the road, uh, they start to wobble a little bit, and so that's part of what we satirize in the book as well. Is that nobody really has a, a pure idea of how the world actually works. You have a, an imperfect idea of how the world works, and you but people are very confident that they understand how the world works. And when uh, the rubber hits the road, things start to fall apart and it produces a result that you don't expect. And then people respond to that new problem that emerges from your idea not really mapping to the world properly. And that creates sort of a historical process. 
it, yeah, and with the Libra gang, you know, they they obviously uh, they make some good points. <laughs> mm-hmm. They uh, you know starting out with um, how everyone in the uninhabited zone where all the mutants live are economically ravaged and over policed, but you know they have a uh, armed zodiac uh, ideology and basically want to you know replace the people in the bubble with uh, with themselves. And, you know, we really we talked about that a lot, about not wanting the the antagonists to simply be, well, you know, literally social justice warriors. You know, we didn't want it to be about Black Lives Matter or about the left and have like a one to one mapping of a movement. It it, first of all, I think it works a lot better as a satire is, you know, going broader and we're incorporating a lot of things into Libra from like conspiracy theories and QAnon type stuff, which was going on when we were writing the book. Um, just like, you know, weird TikTok influencer stuff that happens. Um, it, that's that's all wrapped up in in Libra, because I think to, to make them just like the good, good movement with all good points that wins and uh, does away with the police would be too cheap and, and not as entertaining and sort of like a like a YA book where everything happens like it's supposed to. And the good guys say the good points and then they win in the end. And justice warriors is a, is a decidedly different comic than that. Yeah. I think the, uh, to respond to what you were saying earlier, Lisa, uh, like justice warriors. Oops. I moved my pop filter. Wait, ooh, uh, oh. uh, justice warriors, uh, the one of the main jokes like the the central pillar joke is okay yeah we all agree that something is wrong with the world a lot of people i would say the majority of people agree that there's something wrong with the world um but us knowing that what does that do right cuz it doesn't and and so the joke is that there is like a giant physical structure the bubble that's like sucking our life force away from us and uh, us knowing about it doesn't get rid of it. Mm-hmm. And this idea also that anytime someone in the book comes up with a plan, like, well, this is the answer. This is what we're going to do. That blows up in their face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things we really um, kind of wanted to go for is is just the idea that systemic problems um, sort of dominate the outcomes of, uh, of of situations more so than uh, an individual's choice or, you know, uh, and we didn't want to do a story where, you know, one of the cops kind of has an epiphany and then turns against them or we're just the, the Libra gang wins. It's just it's sort of a lot more complicated. You know, the structure of the world is that is is as it is, just like in our own. And the characters can only do so much within that. You know, there's there's guardrails set up for everybody. What is your planning process like? I know that there's a lot of trading material back and forth. Uh, how often do you guys get to just like talk to each other real time and just like rave about all of the insanity that's happening? Frequently. <laughs> yeah, we talk good. every day. Oh, good. But, you know, we're texting, we're having meetings. Um, I mean, we just, we, we trade ideas constantly or, you know, think of the net. We have so many ideas for Justice Warriors. It's... Uh, it's nuts. If, if it's not clear, this is not a one volume comic. We intend to make many more of these. And we have we have solid ideas for like really for 10 volumes of this stuff. We want to we want to keep going. Yeah. That's so impressive because every page is literally so dense with information. Yeah, we wanted a high. You know, we have a high. We wanted a, a high everything ratio, high action, high joke per page, per panel even, um, but without, you know, losing the plot or being too silly. I, I think it's a pretty, we, obviously it's a, it strives to be funny, but, you know, we wanted to do, get in the story and the politics too. Yeah, there's, a, there's two or three different streams of funny mm-hmm. running through the book, which I'm really proud of. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, there's like... There's the level of plot. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the characters are talking about, uh, for example, the prince uh, in the first third of the book 
he's talking about um, starting a uh, an, uh, selling his record and creating a secondary market for his record so that the prince can have a successful pop record. And what they describe is basically starting a, an unregulated government-backed security. Mm -hmm. So there is a level of satire of how the central bank in the United States operates there. And it's not explicit. Mm -hmm. you, you'd have to know a little bit about economics to get that joke. But mm -hmm. then on the level of the characters are funny and sort of stupid and uh, have a sort of funny repartee with one another, there's that level. And then there are tiny little running gags hidden in the corners of yeah. almost every panel. Yeah. So the prince's palace is uh, sort of like a Rococo palace, but it still has a Star Trek view screen. <laughs> uh, the, every single painting the prince has is of uh, naked women flying through the clouds, mm -hmm. which is tiny little jokes. Uh, there's... Easter eggs for sort of hidden subplots throughout uh, the backgrounds of the entire book. So it's, there's different jokes and different types of humor available for readers who are going to look for it throughout the entire book. Just and are to, you, are you literally thinking like, uh, like a polyphonically where it's like, okay, I got to maintain these three layers at all times. Or is that just like the way that you think? Uh, it's sort of the way that I think because it, the jokes go in at different times. Mm -hmm. So Matt and I will have like a really big overall conversation of like, what are the themes of the book? Mm -hmm. Like, what are we going for? What are we doing with this? And from that, we'll develop that first level of like very abstract uh, jokes of what we're satirizing. And then we go to scripting and we can get some of that... Uh, that's where Matt really, really shines because Matt has some of the funniest dialogue <laughs> I've ever read in this book. Uh, and I'll like text him when I get a draft and be like, you're a genius. I love working with you. Thank God. And then uh, from after scripting, we go into drawing and I need to fill every inch of a page with something. I'm, I'm a maximalist mm -hmm. with how I draw. Uh, and so I'll start putting jokes in and since uh justice warriors really is my baby like i've been working on justice warriors for 10 years just like building what the rules of this world is and Matt, yeah and the characters uh, started with you correct yeah everything started with me and then i asked matt uh, i basically harassed him online until he actually <laughs> took a look at it mm -hmm. and then he was like oh this is actually good and uh, uh, decided to stop being one of the most successful political cartoonists uh, of our generation to make a comic book with me. That's so which, sweet. All, always nice. I like, Thanks, Matt. I yeah. always find in like close um, creative partnerships that there is like a certain amount of romance to it. I would, I would say, I would say so. It was, it was. It was love at first sight. Once it was, uh, once I saw the Justice Warriors uh, pitch. Um, cause, cause for me, um, so, you know, to be clear, Ben said he was working on this for 10 years, but, you know, not drawing the, the comic that it became right. Like right, doing, right. developing it mostly as an animation and which he wanted me to write for and help and help get made. And then I said, you know, we should do this as a comic book because it, first of all, will be a lot easier to get the funding, uh, to get it made by, uh, you know putting together a pitch for a comic book publisher, we have a real shot and, you know, I'm more oriented towards comics uh, myself. Um, but I was, you know, I was a political cartoonist for, for 18 years, but I mean, I, I, I've wanted to do comic books since I was a kid. The short story is I like comics of all kinds, nonfiction, mainstream comics, fiction, genre crap, uh, I, I've always wanted to make it and I was getting to a point where I was very exhausted with what I could say and do with political cartoons. I felt like, you know, I had done all the gun massacre cartoons and abortion cartoons and Black Lives Matter cartoons and every issue oh, is a, over and over and over and running out of things to say and <laughs> felt just very exhausted by it all. And this happened during COVID, you know, which was a very <clears throat> stressful time. 2020 Trump COVID wasn't great many uh, people might recall um was it yeah <laughs> was it really was it actually 
it was Except was it good was it really trust the maybe plan. it was good yeah, uh, yeah it's the star wars holiday special let's like revisit it and uh, reclaim 2020 as a good year. yeah <laughs> one of the best years on record in my opinion um but good things did come from it my second son was born although i would say it wasn't <laughs> wasn't quite the best year to have a baby but uh right. you know and then uh <laughs> yeah, i teamed I up with ben for justice warriors um where was i go I, I was i had a point there at the beginning and i guess it was just that for me i've been meaning to get into genre comics for a long time and when ben showed me this i was like this is right up my alley with the politics the you know the aesthetic influences we uh, things like RoboCop and that were big influences on me and Ben that kind of has some DNA in Justice Warriors. And it was like, oh, if you didn't create this world, I would have gone on and like created something uh, similar to it. And I don't want to do anything alone. Doing doing like something just completely by myself is uh, boring. Like Matt, Matt and I have very different, although we have very similar politics, we have different perspectives on everything and so i think we get somewhere really compelling by sort of uh jousting with one another on what the ultimate perspective on everything is you know the book is this incredible celebration of all your influences as well. Like, I mean, it, it can also operate as an incredible gateway comic. I mean, even if you just look at the homage variants that you have throughout this to like Assault and Precinct 13, to Robocop, to uh, Punisher, who is that? Punisher Warzone? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Punisher Warzone. Uh, you know, you're, you're throwing a lot of your love for various other things into this book. Yes. Um, you know, I mentioned RoboCop. I think RoboCop's one, you know, Ben mentioned The Simpsons. There's Judge Dredd, which I've read a lot of. Um, we're kind of on un, a bat, you know, we don't want to just, we obviously don't want to rip anything off and we don't want to just do references in a very, you know, oh, this is a reference to something, you know, uh, way. But these are our influences and they're sort of uh, there's a there's a blurb that um, we got for the book I like. And it's like, oh, if you were raised on, you know, RoboCop and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and all this other stuff and then had your your brain rotted by Twitter, uh, you know, this is this is the book for you. And that's kind of uh, that's kind of how I view view me and Ben. And there's a very explicitly, too, there's a lot of because there's so many crowd scenes in the book, mm -hmm. so many like massive uh, piles of characters and throughout all of these scenes uh, I slide in a lot of our refer a lot of our um, a lot of characters from these reference points so you can find Eon Flux in there yeah. there's the major from Ghost in the Shell there's a bunch of Tintin characters a lot of Mobius characters a lot of Robert Crumb characters uh, Akira's in there everything is in the background and like still included within the book. So it's, it's fun. It can be a bit of a where's Waldo for you. If you want to just do that. Here's a random influence that I know uh, is in the book. Do you, do you remember the short lived uh, late eighties cartoon series called cops? Yes. Yeah, Where, I do. I, I loved those. I had all the toys. <laughs> bulletproof and long arm and all that stuff. You know, I mean, cops is not, anything i think about very often i i haven't rewatched it since childhood but it it sticks with me and you know there's stuff there's stuff in there that's it's like straight out of cops really you know like the the chief is cybernetic she has those long stretchy arms like uh, inspector gadget that she uses at one point there's uh the the rat advisor who has the the brain on top of his head which you know yeah, sort of yeah. resembles i think that guy's name was dr mindbender but you know dr mindbender wasn't invented the dr mindbender wasn't the first one like that right like that's just riffing off of like 50s sci-fi comics or something you know what i mean so yeah it is sort of taking all of this uh, as you know children of the 80s and 90s just sort of taking all of this pop culture that we've had uh you know pumped into our brains and trying to uh use it to uh, make a make a beautiful painting there's a panel where they where they're getting like a, a police briefing and all the cops are in that panel i gotta go back <laughs> I'm sitting in the right auditorium. Now. 
It's actually uh, the cop cops was uh, partially designed by Peter Chung, creator of Eon Flux. I learned that what uh, from yeah. Peter actually because I took a class from him this year on, on visual storytelling. And he ran us through the entire storyboarding process of the opening sequence of Cops. And uh, I have to say, I know Peter will never listen to this, but I will say Peter Chung is a genius and an incredible resource for people to learn from. I I highly recommend uh, taking part in any class or lessons that he puts up on Instagram. Uh, Huge influence on me. Hell yeah. And you just blew my mind a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna stop. He did Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles too. He, a lot of these like classic '80s opening cartoons. He was uh, director. Well, of if movies. go watch the original um, opening sequence for Rugrats on YouTube, and you will you will go, oh, this is the guy that made Eon Flux. It's, yeah. He, he yeah. did it, you know. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And like that's the other thing about Justice Warriors is it's, um, you know, it, it, it it's. A co- you know it's a buddy cop homage also so it, if you're familiar with that genre at all it, it's such a delight at the same time it's a weird time to be doing yeah. a buddy cop yeah. uh, uh story it's a, it, and and obviously you guys are you know uh eviscerating a lot of cop culture uh with this book but it could also be very very awkward yeah, I think it was something that we were worried about a little bit. Um, maybe worried is not the, the right word, but we we talked about it a lot because, you know, we started working on it in 2020. And like I was saying earlier, this doesn't really have uh, protagonists who um, reflect the politics of the authors or uh, probably most of the readers. But, you know, it's a satire, but sometimes people don't like satires or don't get them. And uh, I guess it was, it was something that we worried about a little bit, but we, we kind of felt that this was the right, the right move, you know, like we're so inundated with uh, cop cop stuff, right? Like you're saying the buddy cop thing is just one subgenre of cop stuff from, you know, Westerns to crime movies to, to whatever else and uh legal thrillers yeah we, we just wanted we wanted to do like you know bad boys uh crossed with robocop crossed with teenage mutant ninja turtles on you know on acid yeah because at a certain point and we've talked about this a lot man and i uh you have to sort of enjoy the media that you're presented you have to enjoy some part of the world and to we're sort of trying to skate that line of having your cake and eating it too, of presenting what uh, a perspective on all of these systemic um, forces that we're, uh, that we're constantly worrying about. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, this comfortable old uh, format of the buddy cop and somehow working through both of those two things at the, at the same time. It feels like one of the points of Justice Warriors is that um, it's it's gotten to the point of hopelessness. Like there's really nothing that (laughs) that can aside from like just scrapping everything and starting completely over. um, There's really nothing that can be done. Um, And I'm wondering, like, so uh, Rob Bell defines despair as seeing (laughs) that tomorrow (laughs) is going to be the same as today. And I'm wondering, like, you've talked about, like, how, uh, like, you find a little bit of that cozy comfort and, like, nostalgia and things like that. But do you feel like um, venting through something like Justice Warriors has helped you get a little salve in the political climate that we're living in? It's made me crazier. <laughs> I, I, as I suspected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't put it as a salve. Um, I would say... I wouldn't even say that it's despair. It, I I like your definition of despair that tomorrow's going to be the same as today because I think it this is where Matt and I differ. I think it's going to be worse. Mm. I'm a huge pessimist. Mm. Uh, I think everything's going to get worse uh, and I have a lot of reasons why I think everything's going to get worse, but uh the way out of that is to go crazy. And that's why Justice Warriors is a crazy comic. It is reflecting uh, a lot of my pessimism is baked into it. And, and Matt spars with me a little bit on this stuff. And uh, 
Yeah, present your point of view, Matt, please. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, politically, especially environmentally, yeah, I mean, I don't know if things are getting better, but I I'm, I, I also sort of, I don't like a lot of the uh, doomer mentality that sort of can take, take a hold of people. Um, I, I think believing that tomorrow is going to be like today is, uh, on the one hand, could be bad, but also could be, a little reassuring in a uh, very d- disruptive world. You know, most people uh, go through, you know, mo- most people don't go through life with having uh, revolutions or the world uh, changing fundamentally. Although we have lived through a period of time where a lot of, a lot of things have changed like the internet and, and everything else. <clears throat> so I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I don't know that I'm ultra positive about uh, how things are going to play out, but, I mean, I have to maintain um, a little hope that something could change. But, but I think ultimately what we're trying to do with Justice Warriors, uh, maybe unfortunately for some readers, is is, is we're not, it, it, it's admittedly not a, uh, a hopeful uh, story. You know, like I was saying, it's not, it's not one where the, the good guys win in the end because there's frankly no good guys shown in the book. Everybody's a little uh, fucked up uh, or, or more than a little fucked up in most cases. And, and I like that we have uh, at least a playground to work through honestly some of the issues and ideas that are presented to us as intelligent adults. Because so often I see in uh, in art and media of like, okay, well, we've overcome it using the, we've overcome these problems using these virtues, and that's the end of the story. Whereas I, I think with this sort of cyclical world that we've built in Justice Warriors in this hopeless world, we can talk about some of the issues that seem hopeless in front of us without uh, giving some sort of panacea of like, all you have to do is be true to yourself Mm -hmm. and you'll solve climate change. No, I I think that there are some real repercussions for the material problems that uh, are in front of us. And uh, I think as intelligent readers and intelligent people, we deserve to work through it. And it doesn't need to be humorless and it doesn't need to be joyless. We can have fun being intelligent creatures working through the problems ahead of us. At the end of the day, though, Justice Warrior is also is just straight up funny. Yeah. Like, it's a yeah. good time. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, everybody <laughs> listening, time. everybody funny, listening yeah. who's made it this far, who's like, oh, this book sounds like a drag. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a great morning and I'm furious. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I you know, and I think I'm I'm kind of interested to I mean, uh I think the book's doing well, but you know, I, it's not like it's uh the, the number one comic of the year or something. I I'd kind of be interested to see what a, you know, an even broader readership would make of it cuz I was I was talking to an old friend who who read it, who was really interested and he was going on about different stuff and it was and it was pretty evident that he had very different politics than me and was getting um, something different in different places of the book. And I thought, but uh, you know, I think that's fine because it, it, first of all, I'd say, you know, I don't know. I might make the claim that justice warriors is the most political book on the shelves. It's I, to me, it's pretty clear what we're doing and we're not super subtle about it in many places, but I also think that you can read a story and enjoy it on different levels. You know, you can just, um, yeah, you know, I, I, if if people don't I walk away with the exact message that I want them to have, that's that's fine. Just rem- if if you remove the plot, if you remove the character, if you remove the dialogue, and you just look at the comic, it is gorgeous. Mm. Like the paneling, the sequential storytelling is excellent. The acting is superb. I was. You know, the, the comic did not naturally come to me. I didn't find it on the shelves. Yeah, It came to me because we started having a conversation online. And I'm so glad that the book did come to me. Because when I open the book up, I go, holy shit, look at this thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and we've talked about the influences of European comics and, you know, animation and what have you. But, you know, beyond the story and the emotion and the righteous fury that Lisa got out of it, it also just doesn't look like any other comic yeah. that's on the stand right now. And yeah, that's good to hear. I was, I was so floored by Happy that. Happy to hear. I was floored by that. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, we have high standards, I think. And that's one of the reasons I, uh, when Ben bugged me and I looked at his, I looked at his work and I was just like, you know, this dude's, this dude's the real deal. Like he can, <laughs> he can draw a comic page on par with uh, the, the top artists, I think. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, it has to be. I, I keep, there's like one panel in issue two, the first page of issue two, <laughs> that is just like this aerial view of Bubble City. It's the first time you really get to see the scope of the city. And uh, that one panel took me 26 hours just yeah. to draw that one panel. And, uh, it, but every time I was like, I have to go that far. I have to go that far with the book because it has to be on par, uh, the comics version on par with a Michael Bay film. Mm. It yeah. has to be <laughs> massive in scope and scale and in action because that's also, that's a level of, that's another level of joke is that it is one of the most juvenile, in many ways, it's one of the most juvenile things I've ever seen. Like you literally have a character who's poop and the <laughs> other one is a weird fish. Yeah. And doing like a, a Michael Bay action film where one cop is high on pills doing drunken boxing with a big ant, uh, that's funny. Mm -hmm. That's funny from a formal perspective. And it's a, it, it's a level of devotion and hard work that I, I feel like pays off. Like the fact that people compliment me on the work and have actually <laughs> taken notice of the fact that I can draw uh, is uh, humbling. I love it. There's a splash page on 105 uh, after the helicopter crash where Swampy looks like he's not going to make it. And uh, shit is crawling to him and gets Swamp in his hands. And that page is one of the best pages I've seen in comics this year. Oh, wow. It's gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's astonishing page. It's good. And, and one of the maybe the only uh, wordless page in a uh, in the book, although there's the big double page spread in the last issue, I, but it has a sound effect. But um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, we're super excited about Justice Warriors. Uh, we think that anybody who is listening to this episode uh, would really dig the comic if they haven't picked it up already. Uh, Please. And, you know, Ben and Matt, thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk about it. Uh, for our listeners that don't look at my show notes and don't click on any of my links that I work so tirelessly to put <laughs> on there, uh, where can they find you online to continue this conversation? Where can they re bleat you? Yeah, on uh, yeah. I'm on Bleeder and uh, okay. Vito Drop. Um, <laughs> I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter as Matt Boers. Pretty easy to find. And I'm on Twitter at Ben Clarkson and on Instagram uh, at Ben Clarkson One Million. The numbers, awesome. not the word. Very the confusing, numbers, Ben. Oh, <laughs> I should have put the words. I'll try to change it. That's a really good. That's a really good solution. Uh, just the words. Well, with more Justice Warriors inevitably in our future, we hope you come back on to uh, chat about their further adventures. Yes, please. Oh, we'd love oh to. Gosh, we're yes. uh, almost it's certain still, yeah. that we're going to be working on uh, Volume 2. We're plotting it out now. Oh, congratulations. Thank you for hanging out. Yeah, thanks a lot for having us. I'm glad you liked the book. Thanks a lot for looking at the book and reading it and being uh, so kind with us. It, it was a pleasure. Uh, our pleasure. Our pleasure, and it was very easy. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Yeah. And there you have it. Once again, our thanks to Matt and Ben for coming on Comic Book Couples Counseling to talk Justice Warriors. Lisa, do you have any other further thoughts about, you know, comics or art in general being a rallying cry versus the having the ability to change minds i honestly do think that one of our main motivations for doing anything on this planet is like to go like hey are you like me or are you unlike me communication right connectivity yeah. but I, I also will never tire of asking that question because i think a lot of the time creators make stuff Without thinking about, okay, like, what is this for and what is it doing? And there are different types of creators, and we've encountered that in uh, in this podcast, right? You'll ask somebody about their theme, and they'll be like, whoa, that 
that didn't occur to me. That was not my take on it. Or, oh, I don't even, th you know, I can't remember who it was, but someone was very adamant about creating without intention. Oh, no, it was for an interview I did for Film School Rejects. I'm going to plug it right here. <laughs> but with Phil Tippett talking yeah. about his uh, stop motion animation film, uh, Mad God, which is all theme. And actually, if you like Justice Warriors, you will really enjoy Mad uh, God, except Mad God has no humor. Yeah. <laughs> it's all despair. But he was adamant that, you know, these images just come into his brain from God or someplace, and he's not steering them at all. Yeah. Like to me, I go like clearly creating stories and saving them and passing along passing them along is like a compulsion of our species. And we wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't somehow keeping us alive. Yeah. Yeah. I do think it that it's good to look at what we are producing and go like, okay, so why? Like, what is this for? What does it make me feel? What does it make me want to do? Like, what am I trying to say? You know, I think all of that is just like interesting. Even if they've never considered the question before and they just come up with the most convenient BS answer. Yeah. You know, like, I think it's just an interesting conversation to have. And I hope that you guys think that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite moments of this conversation actually occurred before we hit record. And we were talking to Matt and Ben about their influences on this book and just as creators in general. And I, I knew that Matt Bors had contributed a piece of art for the Four Color Fantasies charity sketch auction to benefit the literacy volunteers of Winchester, Virginia. And the piece of art that Matt Bors contributed was Spawn. Yeah. He did a blank sketch cover of Spawn and he put a really rad Spawn on it. And I, you know, I just wanted to talk to him a little bit about Spawn because Spawn meant a lot to me. And I did not realize that Matt Bors is a maniac for Spawn comics. He's been reading Spawn every month since it's come out to this day. He has never missed a monthly Spawn issue. And, oh, I wish we had been recording that conversation. So naturally, when I start asking them about the influences of, uh, the influences upon Justice Trek, I wanted to start with some of those flourishes that I was seeing that I felt were... 90s inspired, 90s comics inspired. And, you know, that's when, and, and like, and, and Matt Bores knew what I was doing. And you <laughs> can hear it in the conversation. Matt Bores kicks it over to Ben Clarkson. And Ben Clarkson's major influences being things like the European comics, Mobius and the like. And we, we had that conversation. So we never got back to talking about Spawn with Matt Bores. And I regret that. But hopefully they'll come back on. They seem pretty into that idea. And we can talk some 90s comics. And again, we're going to have a link in the show notes. But that charity auction right now is is happening on Four Color Fantasy's Facebook page. And the Spawn original art piece for Matt Bores currently has no bids on it because I haven't placed a bid on it and I'm waiting it patiently because I want to get this thing for as cheap as I possibly can, but I'm afraid I won't be able to. But it's currently $20, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. <laughs> so come fight Brad and Lisa for the Matt Bores Spawn piece. It's for literacy. It's to help the literacy volunteers of Winchester, Virginia, and yeah, it's going to go for more than $20. I can tell you that much. <laughs> um, there's one th one more thing I wanted to make sure that I said before we sign out. And that is, I don't think that hope is like a requisite for telling a story or uh, even a requisite mm -hmm. for a story that I want to read. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that it is really important for me to challenge myself. Like, I've been doing a whole ton of just like straight up comfort consuming. Yeah. I have been on a tear with <laughs> listening to queer YA romances. Yeah. And we've been watching pretty much nothing but, but Top Chef. Master Chef, Top Chef. I've Next started Level playing Chef. Webkins again. <laughs> I can't like, believe you brought it up. Because uh, it's humiliating. Um, <laughs> but uh, you got to be vulnerable, right? But so I've really been like at my bassist yeah. when it comes to what I'm consuming in my free time. And I do think that it is important that like... I go like, well, what if hope isn't a thing? I think that that is important to think about. And I encourage all of you to go out of your media consumption, uh, like comfort, comfort modes. Comfort zone. Yeah. 
Yeah, get out of that comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. Know? But then you can crawl back in. Yeah, crawl back in. <laughs> I know that they've uh, retired a lot of accounts, and I don't even remember my uh, original well, login anyway. To Webkins. To Webkins. <laughs> All of those animals are dead. Yeah. <laughs> but I've got a new animal, me and this bunny. Oh, we're going to take like it into my 40s. <laughs> stop watching our MasterChef marathon. Hell no. Oh, oh, we're oh, almost done. We're almost done. We're, yeah. we're doing it in reverse, and we're on season four. Yeah, and it gets way worse in yeah. reverse, I'll tell you that much. The yeah. early MasterChef is rough to get through. But we're going to do it. But we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Uh, friends, thank you for hanging out with us. This was a really fun conversation with Matt and Ben about Justice Warriors. Again, I implore you to check it out. I really do think it's one of the best comics to hit the shelves in 2023. And, you know, again, like just from an art point of view, like, holy shit, this thing looks crazy good. And uh, I'm in awe of it. So please Head on over to Ohoi Comics' website, link in the show notes. Take a look at some of those pages. And if it looks like your thing, and maybe even if it's not your thing, maybe you need to get out of that comfort zone and read some Justice Warriors. But you might also find some comfort zone within that Justice Warriors. So there you have it. We have a lot going on in the Patreon feed this week. We have another Creator Cranny conversa conversation coming to you real quick with Stefan Frank talking about his crime comic Palomino, which just launched its Kickstarter for Volumes 2 and 3. Lisa and I really enjoyed Volume 1, but Volume 2 and 3 is where it's at. The comic takes off in that second volume. I freaking love Stefan Frank. I had a conversation with him about what if he was an art director on season one. He's an art director on season two. And we talk Marvel. We talk Jack Kirby. It is a great conversation. It's a great comic book. He's an incredible artist. So be on the lookout for that. We are also going to do a ride along car review this Thursday night. We have tickets for a 10 o'clock showing at the Alamo Draft House of Evil Dead Ride. Yeah, yeah. We, we should probably rewatch some Evil Dead films in anticipation. Maybe it, tonight. Love it. Yeah, let's get let's break out Evil Dead 1 and 2. Yeah. Let's do that. That would be great. And we are also got our Sleepwalking Through Sandman because we overstuffed our weekend. We really didn't have the time to give the next issue its proper due, but it is coming, you know, we're, we're, we know that we're also at the end of Sandman, so we're maybe stretching it out a little bit, but we don't want to annoy our sleepwalking through Sandman uh, listeners like Scott, you know, like, yeah, I know Scott's just here <laughs> for the sleepwalking through Sandman and we've been torturing him with him with some delays. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So be on the lookout for that. And then on the main feed, we have a creator corner conversation with Jackson Lansing and Colin Kelly talking about. Star Trek. Ooh. They wanted to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy. We said, sure, fine, later. We're talking right now about Star Trek. And we really enjoyed ourselves. Yeah, it's a great way to just celebrate Benjamin Sisko, Is the best Star Trek out? captain. Not yet. It's oh, going to okay. be out on Wednesday. I was like, I don't remember doing an intro and outro to that. <laughs> you have not done it yet, Lisa. Okay, good. I, and I'm then, losing it. Do we talk about the interview we're doing tomorrow? Do we talk about that? I mean, it hasn't happened yet. I would, you know me, I want to wait. Okay, all right. We won't. If you're in the Slack channel, you know who it is. Yeah. You know, so the, the you know, the $5 tier, they know. They know. <laughs> so if you want to know who it is, uh, head you over know, to the Slack. You know, we've suffered some recent disappointment, so <sighs> it's just like. And we haven't told anybody. Well, no, we told Slack about that, too. Yeah. But they don't know that that's been delayed like six times. <laughs> but, but Okay. We got something we got something cooking that's pretty exciting too. And then yes, we also have our next episode in our Mark and Eve Invincible series. We will be talking next week about Invincible Full House just after the reboot arc when poor Tara has grown up with her dad. He's come back. He's lost 5 years of her life. What the heck is going to happen, Lisa? Lisa has not read that I, I have trade not. yet. And uh yeah, but like curious, Invincible uh, Saga is way more like Invincible than you I thought. initially knew. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It really is. Okay, on that note, my friends, we are going to get out of here. I got to go to work. You got to go to work. Until next time, keep your love tank full. And your sacred rapport open. Doopy doopy. <laughs> <laughs>